Good afternoon, everyone. This is Anthony Alaka with Torrey Hills Capital. I want to welcome you to the Millennial Precious Metals webcast for June 21st, 2022. Hope everyone's doing well under the circumstances. Thanks for taking the time uh, today to join our virtual lunch. We are very excited to bring you Millennial Precious Metals today. They are a Nevada-based exploration company with seven properties in Nevada and a newly acquired property in Arizona. The company is starting an aggressive drill program at its key assets with a PEA expected later this year. We feel that the company is well positioned to be a multi-million ounce producer. Uh, the company trades on the OTC market under the ticker MLPMF and on the TSX Venture under the ticker MPM. It's currently trading with a market cap of roughly $50 million. The company has a strong balance sheet, high percentage of institutional ownership, and is trading at a discount to its peers. So we feel there is plenty of upside as the company continues to execute its strategy. And uh, obviously, based on the higher outlook for inflation, um, in the U.S., gold prices are expected to move higher, making precious metal stocks uh, very attractive at this point. And we feel that millennial uh, precious metals is well positioned to benefit from the positive outlook, uh, not only for gold, but uh, for the mining space in general. So with us today to discuss millennial precious metals, Metals, operations and growth strategy going forward is the company's president and CEO, Jason Kosek, and the company's VP of corporate development, Jason Banducci. It's great to have you both on today, and thanks for taking the time to bring our viewers up to speed on Millennial Precious Metals. Uh, as we were just discussing, it's obvious a lot of exciting developments are happening with the company and the sector, and I'm excited for you to share those with the group. Uh, before we get started, I just want to mention if our viewers have questions during the presentation, uh, the easiest way is to simply type them into the uh, Q&A or chat box. It will make sure that they get answered. If you can't do that, uh, click the raise your hand icon and uh, I can unmute your microphone and you can ask directly. So uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Jason Kosick who's gonna walk us through uh, the presentation and then we're gonna open it up for questions. So uh, with that said, Jason, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Anthony, and thanks for everyone for, for joining today. Uh, much appreciated, and I'm glad uh, Zoom worked their kinks out later on in the day. Um, just by way of background, uh, I'm a structural geologist by trade, uh, worked with the Talisker Group, and we did all technical due diligence for all of Cisco-related companies. Uh, that's really my background. And something that's different about our company is really how it started. We did over 337 desktop reviews as a private company, over 72 site visits to build this very diversified portfolio. And just to note, we went public in May of 2021. So this is a brand new company, brand new assets that have never been in the public domain for, for over a decade. We will be making some forward-looking statements, so please look at the company's disclaimer uh, on, on the website. What we're doing as Millennial Precious Metals is building a multi-million ounce, multi-asset heap leach project uh, in, in Nevada. And why we're focusing on near-service heap leachable ounces is because the cost per discoverable ounce, so how much drilling do we have to do to realize that resource is extremely low in these types of deposits and the capex to put them into production is extremely low, which is very important in an inflationary environment. We choose Nevada as Nevada is the number one mining jurisdiction ranked by the Fraser Institute in the world. Uh, if Nevada was a country, it would be the fifth largest gold producer in the world, over 255 million ounces. So one of the most well-endowed piece of, pieces of the Earth's crust. Um, Right now, really, what do you get uh, with Millennia as a high-level overview? You get Mountain View and Wildcat that host the 1.2 million ounces of oxide. They're taking the brunt of the 20,000 meters of drilling. Mountain View and Wildcat, think about them as a combined project. They will have an updated resource um, at the end of the third quarter and a PEA in the fourth quarter. Right now, just for a frame of reference, on a consensus NAV basis, we trade at about 0.15 on a PNAV basis. And just so for a frame of reference that we will we'll chat about later on, and I'm sure Anthony will want to bring it up, is all the M&A that's starting to heat up in Nevada. And on a PNAV basis, on a consensus basis, uh, companies are acquiring projects in Nevada at 0.75 to 0.8 
times now. We're trading at 1.5. So once the PEA is out, there's a significant re-rating opportunity just with Wildcat and Mountain View. The rest of the portfolio is your blue sky and your free carry that you don't necessarily pay for with Millennium. Um, today, we'll, we won't touch on Dune, Eden, Mar, or Oslo. They're very uh, they're phase one target generation projects. Uh, we also have a project, a copper silver project in Arizona. Uh, again, we won't touch on them because they're too early stage, but we will briefly touch on Red Canyon. And while we'll touch on that is it's right in the heart of the Battle Mountain Eureka trend, one of the most prolific trends in Nevada. It's 35 kilometers south of the Cortez complex, which is one of the the largest deposits in Nevada, sits in the same rocks, sits on the same fault system, and has the same age of intrusive uh, characteristics. And we put in some of the best drill holes uh, that we'll discuss later on. And lastly, you have a team between myself, Terry, and Ruben. We've done this seven times. We've put up over 60 million ounces of discoveries. And of the seven times, five of those projects are in construction or in production today. From the team, uh, you have myself, um, as I said, structural geologist, uh, Terry and, and, and Ruben, both PhD uh, geologists, ex-BHP and Angle Gold Ashanti. Uh, they founded Las Colossus and Grandma Latte. Mike Leskovic is the CFO of uh, Northfield Capital, which is a fund in Toronto. Sarah Heston is a business professor at Stanford. And Eric Tremblay is a mining engineer. He's also the COO of Dalradian uh, and was the uh, GM who built Canadian Malarctic Canada's largest coal mine. Raphael Duteau, who's our VP of Exploration. He's a PhD in geostatistics and resource optimization. And Jason Banducci, who's also on the line, I'll let him introduce himself now, but a very diversified team that, uh, that, we let, that we've put together. Thanks, Jay. Uh, so I, I, as you mentioned, so my background's on the finance and capital market side. I spent the last eight years uh, on the banking side, the last five of which in mining investment banking. So covering companies like Millennial. So I've been you know, pitched by way too many junior mining companies in my career. And I only did this for, for five years. Um, but I think, you know, when you're on that side of the table, there's three things that are important. You want to look at the quality of the project, the quality of the people, and as a junior company, the ability to raise capital. And I think, you know, when I was trying to decide whether I should join the team, all three of those boxes were checked. As Jay just mentioned, you know, we've got one of the best teams in the space from a technical uh, and, and financial perspective. Two, we're going to get into it later, but we've got the highest quality projects in the best mining jurisdiction in the world. And three, again, from an ability to raise capital, we just closed uh, an oversubscribed $16 million financing last week. There's not too many junior gold exploration companies that can do that in this market. So I think that's your, your third box checked. And you know those are the three reasons that I, that I joined the team. And I think the three reasons why you should seriously consider uh, if you're going to if you're going to invest in junior gold equities, which we think is a great time to do so. We think millennial uh, is, the, is the top of the list. Awesome. Uh, quickly, from a share structure perspective, I think that one of the things that sets us out significantly uh, from our peer group is that we're 65 percent institutionally held in only two high net worth clients. OK. Uh, you won't see this type of share roster on any company sub $100 million market cap. And the reason for that is our track record, both from a technical, technical perspective on execution, uh, being able to raise capital, and really to identify quality projects, as Jason Banducci just mentioned. Um, management and board are sitting at 9%. Um, we got slightly diluted in the last financing, but you know, I'm the second largest individual shareholder. I put over $650,000 on my own money. You know, I'm, I'm 34. If I was Richard Wark, that's, that's nothing, but to me, it's a significant chunk. Um, as Jason Banducci mentioned, we just raised 16.1 million. Uh, we're currently sitting at $17 million. We had a 
$3.2 million payment to Waterton and obviously had to pay bankers and lawyers for the financing. So we sit at 17 currently. Uh, 178 million shares out. Uh, I should note the financing was done at 40 cents. I believe we're at 37 Canadian today uh, with a half warrant, uh, two year coupon on the warrant done at 55. Um, really, uh, the, we got four analysts covering us. Uh, ranging from 90 cents to $1.40. And what they're really modeling is, is, is what the PEA will demonstrate. And then again, applying a 0 0.5, 0 0.4 multiple to the net asset value to get your target price. So this is where we see really the this, this story going uh, after the PEA. Um, and we can, we can get touch on it uh, later on. And really, very small flow, only 16.5% uh, uh, retail. Um, I think it's very important as we build our brand as millennial, as the next generation of a, of a mining house, uh, to really educate the public that mining is a key pillar to our society. Uh, you know, gold has been a, a stable and a safe haven for thousands of years. I uh, should have probably put up the chart, but I believe since it's the best performing asset class um, uh, of the decade, since 2020, it's up 584%. I believe the S&P 500 is up like 281. So it's one of the best performing asset classes. So, you know, mining is a key pillar to our society, but we can be, it can be done in an environmentally and socially sustainable manner. Uh, and I think that's something that we also forget. Um, I'm going to get into the assets right now. Um, if anyone wants to dive into, dive into the weeds and, and really talk about low sulfidation epithermals and, and talk about uh, fluid inclusions and, 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 and alteration signatures, we can do that all day. Um, but for the presence of time, uh, I'll keep it very high level. Right now, these are pit constrained ounces. We're running them at a $1,500 pit shell, $2 ton mining for processing to GNA. The key metric to these is that there's no strip and there's no waste rock. We'll show you why that's important later on. And the grade sits at 0.4 and currently we're at 776,000 ounces. Right now we have two rigs operating. Uh, the program is designed to do the geotech, to do the metallurgy, to see what the resource conversion rate is. Um, you could see the pit shell that I'm outlining in red right here. There's nice high grade starter blocks right at surface. There's no waste rock. On a long section, here's the pit shell. All these blocks are not in the current resource. And that's just a factor of drill spacing and our, our lack of understanding on the metallurgy, which we are answering this year. Um, it should be noted that right now we see significant strike extent of over 2.3 kilometers by 1.2 kilometers. Um, and in Nevada, there's two types of drill permits. Uh, really that there's an NOI, which gives you five acres of disturbance, which we are currently under. So, you know, we cannot drill on all these prospective hillsides that we would like to drill on. Um, but really, once we have the full permit in, in 2023, there is significant resource growth potential, not only at depth, as I've just underlined here, but in all these gap areas that sit outside the current pit shell. So, you know, when you look at it, 2.3 by 1.2 by 150 meters, you use 2.5 for density. You know, there's a possibility, you know, everything is not gonna be mineralized. You know, there's a possibility to have over 200 million tons of ore and we're currently sitting at 67 million tons. Um, I'm not gonna get too into the weeds here as well, all this is saying is right now, we sit currently right in the top section of, of the system. So nothing has been drilled off into these feeder zones where you're gonna have the highest grade mineralization. Um, they form basically like a mushroom, fluid migrates up vertically, hits a more permeable horizon and then bleeds out. Uh, and this is the area right here 
where you would have the highest grade mineralization and it's never been drilled. So there's a lot of scalability uh, to, to Wildcat uh, as its own. Um, we've significantly increased our land package by over 87%. You know, this is the current pit right here. There's a significant upside for, for exploration. Um, what we've done is we've already secured land, our, our, our land package for the, for the pads, the power line, the road goes right through there. So doing big company things, because we've done it so many times, um, really removing any, any, any inherent risk uh, from a permitting perspective. Uh, Mountain View, we're running the same numbers. So $1,500 pit shell, $2 ton mining, four processing, two GNA. It's currently sitting at 427,000 ounces. The grade's much higher at 0.57. Then this strip is a little bit higher. I should note that the average grade for open pit heap leachable ounces in Nevada is 0.57. Three eight, so these are higher uh, than the average grade in in the Great Basin. Um, we just finished up this program again. It was designed to do the geotech, see what the resource conversion was. It was twenty seven holes, 7,200 7, meters. What we realized is the grade is significantly higher than we expected. Uh, we have, you know, when we talk about the mushroom in the feeder zone. We drilled, you know, almost a meter of 141 grams. Remember, the average grade of this deposit is 0.57. Uh, the overburden isn't a true overburden. It's composed of sand and gravel. So what does that mean? From a mining perspective, it's not going to be $2 a ton because it's not conventional drill and blast. It's what we call as a free dig. So you basically dig it out with a backhoe. So it has a positive impact uh, uh, on the economics you can see that the rock is really broken up. So when you place the crushed rock on a, on a pad, um, there's less um, energy going into crush the rock to break it down. Uh, so it lowers your CapEx and enhances your internal rate of return. The other outstanding thing is the grade continuity here is spectacular. You know, we're talking 185 meters of almost 1.5 grams per ton. Remember the average grade of the Great Basin is 0.38. So orders of magnitude higher. Uh, we drilled one step out hole, you know, that was almost 40 meters of four grams. This, what is the significance of holes like that? That adds 100,000 ounces with one hole. So the prospectivity along, along this fault system, we're only looking at this basically this little mushroom cap right there. And the prospectivity along this range front is highly probable. The way things, the way these occur is fluid migrates up these fault systems and these fractures and hits these more permeable horizons. And when you go from compressional tectonics to extension, you create flash boiling and cause the gold to precipitate out. Why is that significant here? is that this range front fault that controls all the mineralizing fluid has been mapped for over three kilometers. So again, we're under this postage stamp of a five acre permit. So that to expand the current resource uh, is highly probable in the, in, in the coming years. Again, we've significantly increased our land package. You can see it by the green areas here. Uh, again, over 80%. Why did we do that? There's a lot of prospectivity to the Northeast, securing power lines, securing roads uh, and access to water. Um, I'm just gonna touch on Red Canyon briefly. You know, we drilled 12 holes, 2,300 meters. You know, for example, this hole, hole two, was in the top 1% of gold intercepts drilled in 2021. Three of the intercepts were in the top 10%. So, you know, this is, could be something that could be world-class. We don't know. We've only put 12 holes into the project, um, but it sits in the right rocks. It sits on the same fault system, and it has the same date for the intrusive rocks. So for Nevada, you need to be between 30 million and 40 million years. Um, really, this is what I think drives the, drives the real value 
with, with millennial is that in order to understand what the true grade is, is you need to do the grade divided by the strip ratio. And what is the strip ratio? Is how much waste to or do you have? So how much waste rock do you have to move and pay for in your operating costs to get to your ore? So this allows you to compare apples to apples. And a lot of companies will never show you this because it looks, frankly, it looks really bad for them. For us, we have the highest effective open pit oxide project in the best mining jurisdiction in the world. To put it in perspective, GSV sits at 0.77. Um, their effective grade is at 0.19. They have 1.3 million ounces. We have 1.2. They were just acquired by Orla last week for $235 million. And Jason Van Nuge can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, $235 on that. And like I said, right now on a price to net asset value consensus, um, the average acquisition cost for projects of this quality is between 0.75 and 0.8. Uh, and we sit at 0.15. So why do we sit at 0.15? There is risks and in, risks involved because we don't have an economic study, which we will have in the fourth quarter. So why are all these institutions writing big checks? Because they believe that we will do the quality work to execute that re-rating opportunity in the next couple of months. Um, quickly, just so everyone knows, mining is like any other business in the world. And it just comes down to margin, okay? So people ask, how do you make money at 0.42? Well, it's quite simple. At $1,600 gold, the average operating cost per ton milled is $11, okay? So in the price of the, the institute value of the gold at $1,600 is $22. So the in situ margin is 49% at $1,600. You know, Apple doesn't make a 50% margin, okay? The way we build mining companies is that it doesn't matter what metal environment it is, we always make money, okay? You know, if gold at today's prices, you know, we're close to a 60% margin, okay? Um, that's the quality of these projects. You know, right now, I think the most important thing to know is the average acquisition cost for ounces in Nevada is $90, okay? Um, they range from, I believe, 65 all the way up to 150. Um, and we're currently trading at $29 on an EV to ounce ratio. We will show significant resource growth to trade in line uh, with our with our peer groups, uh, and we will see significant re-rating opportunity uh, once we put out the updated resource in, in the PEA. From a catalyst perspective, one thing that we believe in as Millennial Precious Metals is that we believe in systematic, scientific, but aggressive exploration. And since we went public over a year ago, uh, it would be a year, May 8th, I believe. We've gone public on two exchanges. We've acquired eight projects, drilled three, almost drilled 20,000 meters to, to date. We've raised over $45 million. Uh, in the next couple of months, we'll, we'll finish that drill program. We'll do all the met work, we'll do the resource, and we will do the PEA uh, in, in the fourth quarter, which will be the real value driver. And in summary, really, you have the team that's done this seven times and put up over 60 million ounces. These are your two value drivers that you trade at 0.15 times NAV. You'll get a significant re-rating opportunity after the PEA. The rest of the portfolio and all the growth potential you get at Mountain View and Wildcat are for free. It is literally the number one mining jurisdiction in the world. Um, these are some of the highest quality assets. Remember, it's the highest effective open pit oxide project in Nevada. 
a strong institutional uh, ownership at 65%. Management has a significant chunk of skin in the game and a very catalyst rich story. Uh, with that, Anthony, I think, you know, I kept it under the, the 30 minutes and we can <laughs> open the floor for, for any questions. Yes. Um, and thank you, uh, Jason. Appreciate that. Um, and I want to, um, you know, just, reiterate that like Jason Van Ducci mentioned earlier, he was pitched by a lot of junior mining companies. We at Torrey Hills are also pitched by a lot of junior mining companies and we're very selective in who we like to take on as a client. And for us, uh, Millennial Precious Metals uh, checked all the boxes in terms of strong management team, obviously an excellent jurisdiction. I think their shareholders, um, you know, roster speaks for itself. And this is clearly a management team uh, that's put their money where their mouth is. So, um, you know, we think that um, they will be a, a multi-million ounce producer if someone else uh, doesn't come in and take them out uh, before then. So um, we're going we're gonna to open it up for questions. Um, so if you have a question, type it into the Q&A or chat box and uh, we'll make sure that it gets answered. Uh, with regards to uh, your last, um, with the financing, uh, why did you choose to raise money through the market versus maybe selling royalty or, or going that route? Yeah. So, um, you know, one reason is, is that we saw, there's a bunch of uh, bigger institutions that wanted a bigger piece. And, and, and that was Franklin Templeton uh, and, and, and Delbrook and, and Crestcat were kind of hounding us consistently to, to put more money into the company because they saw the quality of the assets. Um, and right now, um, really to, to, to get the value off of, of, off of royalty, you really need your, your PEA complete. So royalty companies, once you have a PEA, will give you a money at 0.7 to 0.8 times uh, net asset value. Um, but before that, they won't really give you that 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 valuation um so we thought it was beneficial to to let in our, our our strategic institutional shareholders that wanted to increase their position and really support the company um and then moving forward once we we, we put out our pea you know you can still sell a one percent royalty because the royalty burden on all these assets are are, are quite low wildcats at 1.9 percent uh, and Mountain View, depending on where you are in the pit, is between two and three. Um, and, you know, a 1% royalty can net you, you know, 15 to, to, to $20 million, right. uh, depending on what multiple to nav you're going to use. So, you know, you can only pull that royalty card once. Um, so I, I, I rather push it out to really um, get the full value of what that 1% will and you think that technically could come uh, once you uh, come out with the PEA, obviously. Yeah, I, I think that the you know from a from a capital raising perspective, I think you know the the steer away from a, another equity raise unless you know we're trading at you know a dollar fifty to two dollars, and then we might look at it again. Um, but uh, I think for for the next raise, you know sometime in, in 2023, um, you know, we would look at a royalty then so we can get full value for, for that royalty. Yeah, and to, to your point, um, talking about 2023, obviously this cash position gets you through some pretty big milestones um, in terms of the re-rating and, and things like that. So uh, you guys are good for cash for a while, correct? Yeah, correct. So we're, we're fully funded right through this year and into, into early 2023. You know, people, you know, question why we, we raise money when we had, you know, six million dollars in the bank. Uh, the reality is, is we owed Waterton, who we bought the assets from, we owed them three point two million dollars. So that would have squeezed our cash position. And then people would have started shorting into the stock knowing yeah. that we were going to do a financing. Uh, so we had everything lined up in, in some, you know, big backers and and we went when the money was on the table. And I think, you know. A lot of junior companies are starving for cash mm -hmm. um, and they're waiting and waiting and waiting for, for a better market. And, you know, re realistically, I don't, I don't know where this market is going. I think from a macro perspective, inflation is here to stay. You're going into a recession. 
uh, and really the, the uh, commodity space is the one that kind of um, will be the best value add for, for people to hold value. Yeah. Agreed. And I think, you know, it's, it's also, if, if we do go into, or if the U S goes into a recession, right, that's going to, that's going to put major pressure on the U S dollar, U S dollar goes down. The gold price should, should act in a very favorable way. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and, and I think part of the reason you see the support of our shareholders is yes, they believe in management and yes, they believe in the project, but they're also in the business of making money. And, you know, you see where the smart money is moving right now. And anyone who has the capability to invest in mining stock, and there's a lot of other depressed sectors as well. But, you know, if you look at the valuations where the equities are trading, they're totally out of whack with an 1850 gold price, right? Based on the equity levels now, you think the gold price would be 15, 1400. So there's a big value dislocation. And if you have capital to put to work, it's a great time to be shopping for, for gold equities, right? Because at some point the market's going to turn. We don't know when it's going to be. We're fully funded to get through all of our major catalysts. Um, but when it does turn, it's the right management teams, the companies with good projects and good jurisdictions, and the ones that are well capitalized that are, that are going to make the biggest move and make the move first. And we're confident we're in that small subset of, uh, of junior gold exploration companies. Yeah, we've been um, obviously, uh, you know, following the mining sector for a long time. And we're really excited about the next few years and what we're going to see out of gold. Um, so we agree with you on that. And uh, normally, you know, uh, companies like, um, you know, in the exploration space are like the last ones to go, but when they go, they go fast. And we've been part of those uh, in the past. And we feel that that will continue to set, set up that way going forward. So um, completely agree with you. And there is definitely a disconnect between the price of gold and valuations on these stocks right now. Um, so you talked mostly about Wildcat and Mountain View, um, but Jason Banducci had, you know, sent me the Crestcat Capital link, uh, and they really focused on Red Canyon, which is really, I think, I'd like for you to touch on the potential there because obviously, you know, great drill results out of Wildcat and Mountain View, but you know, Red Canyon could be like the gem in the entire portfolio. Yeah, so you know, Quentin Henning is a very Brilliant geologist. Uh, he he's been, been able to sniff out these things for for quite some time, and you know exactly why I get so excited about Red Canyon is the same reason that he does. Is that you know when you're looking for world class ore bodies in Nevada, uh, you need to have the right rocks. So. Um, we do have that. We sit in the wind band formation, which, which hosts um, Pipeline and Cortez. So you know, that's 55 million ounces in that one rock type. It has major regional mid-crustal breaks, which is the wall fault. That wall fault runs through the Cortez complex. Again, 55 million ounces there. Okay. It has a lot of decalcification and calcareous sedimentary rocks. It has extensive mercury, arsenic, tellurium uh, signatures. In uh, the real key one is um, you need magmatic or uh, uh, really magmatic fluids uh, and you need intrusive rocks. Um, that's where those rocks or fluids are coming from. And the key to, to the date of the mineralizing event. So what we do as geologists is we know in Nevada for carling style deposits, the age of mineralization needs between 30 million years old and 40 million. And our age date sits at 35.5. So when big, big companies look at us or guys like uh, Quentin Henning, you know, every major checkbox you want to look for Red Canyon hits. Not only that is that you have, you know, the top 1% of drill intercepts in of gold drill intercepts in 2021, um, you know, on a, uh, on a gold grade 
uh, times the times the interval length, and you know three in the top ten percent, and that's our first twelve holes. So every major thing that you look for, Red Canyon checks the box, and it's you know thirty five kilometers south of of Cortez. Um, that being said, it's very it's a very grassroots project. Um, it's very exciting, um, but you know we would like to have that re rate. Uh, to train in line with our peer group with Wildcat and Mountain View before we're going to raise um, a lot more capital for, for Red Canyon. Um, there are a lot of interesting parties in, in that, 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 that want to look at this, um, but as a, as a real exploration guy, I, I try and hold off uh, giving away a project when, when it checks every box. Um, what was the decision, by the way, to go in to, to start with um, Wildcat and Mountain View as opposed to Red Canyon? So we actually started off with Red Canyon. Um, that, those were the these were our first, you know, we drilled 12 holes and these are kind of the first nine that were, you know, 35 meters of 0.5. It's, it's a rock and hole in Nevada for oxides. OK, mm -hmm. um, so we started off with that. Um, you know, maybe it was a mistake. I, I, I don't know. But, you know, we, when we went public, we put these two holes out thinking, you know, oh, my God, like, you know, this is the top 1%. The stock is going to run here. Um, and there was just no reaction. And I think it's because um, no one knew we were around. Uh, you know, we literally put them out two weeks after going public. So um, we actually started off with this. And we wanted to um, let the geologists drill their holes in here first, then compile all the data, compile the geophysics, finish their mapping while we we're you know, executing a drill program at Wildcat Mountain View. And then hopefully later on this year or next year, we can, we can come back once we understand the, the kinematic model for Red Canyon. Yeah, which uh, Anthony, it's important to know, right? Like, Red Canyon does not have a resource, whereas when we bought Mountain View and Wildcat, there is a definable resource there. We can quickly or more quickly advance those projects mm -hmm. into a position where we're going to see value in the market, right? And if we see value in the market, and that takes our share price from, you know, 40 cents Canadian up to 80, 90 a dollar Canadian, then when we go to raise money to fund a, a program at Red Canyon, you can see how it's a lot better for our shareholders, including ourselves from a dilution perspective, right? And then, yep. you know, we know, and, and as Jason said, the, the drill programs that are going to be required to properly drill out Red Canyon, like it's not going to be cheap, right? So we understand that we may need a partner, um, but right now the focus is on Mountain View wildcat to get that updated resource and PEA out so we can really bring up the value of the company, which will allow us to execute not only on putting those two assets into development, but also on properly exploring Red Canyon. And again, this, this you know, completely ignores the four other assets we've got uh, in, in Nevada and another one in Arizona. So you yep. can see the more and more we talk about this, you know, it's not just a one trick pony company where we're, you know, all of our eggs are in one basket for Mountain View and Wildcat. We've got essentially four different parts of the company that we're able to continue to move along in tandem and, and switch the narrative and news flow between those four streams, depending on what's going on. Yeah. And to your, to your point earlier about possibly doing some sort of a partnership, would you could obviously consider doing some sort of JV with this, or would you consider even selling it or is the, is the, is the goal to, to hold on to it? Yeah. It's too early to, 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 to say that just yet, I'd uh, be possibly open to a JV, but outright selling it like no way. Yeah. Uh, Cause we, we have no idea what's there, yeah. but the way we design the company is to have this diversified portfolio of assets so that, you have your development stage assets that will go into a permit mine permit pipeline uh, next year. And then Red Canyon will come up to a drill resource PEA. And then one of the other five 
will come up to a red canyon level. So you always have this organic growth pipeline um, to, 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 to build off of. And, and then that's the way real mining companies are built. Yeah. So you think the current valuation of the company is only showing Mountain View and Wildcat and all the other properties aren't even on the radar. <laughs> you're showing, you're showing 0.15 yeah. on a multiple basis of just Mountain View and Wildcat, which is why, you know, when we like to, the, the easiest pitch, the easiest sell of how you're going to make money here is based on just Mountain View and Wildcat, you can make a three or four times return in the next six months to a year. You get the rest of the portfolio for free. Yeah, absolutely. Um, as, as I mentioned, the consensus now uh, on acquired assets is between 0.75 and 0.8. That's the that's the consensus now, and we're trading at 0.15. So yeah. you know, easily three to five x uh, once that PEA comes out. Yeah, um, which I wanted to get to it obviously because um, it's really important. Obviously, recent consolidation. Uh, we talked about Orla acquiring gold standard ventures um b2 gold acquired oklo lundin acquiring jose maria like when you look at those valuations of what you know those companies were were bought out at, and even any other companies you can give as an example i mean you guys are way 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 underneath in terms of um in terms of the valuation uh so like how does that set you guys up for you know for the future here like what you know, what's going to be the tipping point? You know, I, I, I strongly think the PEA will be the tipping point. It's a very robust PEA. So, you know, a lot of the work that are major showstoppers like the Met or the Geotech, they're basically almost feasibility level level work. Um, and really, when you, when you go down the list, even in Nevada, you know, Hasbrook is 50% owned by Sun Valley and they do not want to develop it until it goes at $3,000. Mm -hmm. So that's basically a private company. Northern Bullfrog is gone. Gold Rock is gone. Pan was bought by Caliber. Florida Canyon is a big company. Argonaut, Round Mountain is Kinross. Motherload, gone. Uh, Railroad just got bought. And, you know, we're number one on the list. And I, I think, you know, where we really see this going is there is a serious chess match uh, going on in Nevada, you know, with Anglo, with Kinross. Now you have Caliber in there. Now you have Orla and Pierre Lassan in there. You also have Richard Work and Augusta in there. Uh, and there's a lot of moving pieces in Nevada. Uh, and really all we can do right now is, as a team is really drive the value and deliver this PEA as quickly as fast, as quickly as as we can and really execute on what we said we were going to do right from day one. Um, and once that's done, I think, you know, it'll be a, an eye opener for, for everyone else on the street. Yeah, absolutely. And Anthony, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's important. So, I mean, this slide's great because this highlights the scarcity value, but if you flip to the comps, Jay, so We've, you know, as we mentioned, there is not too many of these projects left. You've seen six or seven of them disappear in the last year. I think on this slide, what, what it really highlights is the, the value dislocation, right? Like we're, we're currently about a $50 million market cap US. Uh, GSV was taken out at about 190 million US, right? So it's four times the size of where we're currently at. Um, and GSV is just railroad and pinion, right? They don't have a Red Canyon. They don't have a Cerro Colorado. They don't have other early stage. So, so you can see why just on Mountain View and Wildcat, which is what we believe we're valued on now, that's your four times return. Um, and, and, you know, you see the multiples GSV is getting taken out. This is at the bottom of the market, right? Yep. Stocks have not been this cheap in a long, long time. And GSV was taken out at, $65 an ounce total. So that includes oxide and sulfide. We've got 1.2 million ounces of straight oxide. If you look at it on an oxide only basis, GSV was taken out at $110 an ounce. We trade at 30 on pure oxide, 
right? So when you look at you, you look at what we're doing, you know, there's a huge value dislocation in the market, and one that's driven by you know the the overall sentiment. But you know, as long as we're able to continue proving out, growing our resource, and advancing our projects towards a production decision, which Again, don't forget GSV is still at least a year away from from uh, from construction. So, you know, when you look at how we're valued at thirty dollars an ounce right now, we think there's a ton of upside. You know, the last four or five years, the average acquisition cost is between ninety and hundred dollars, depending on the ounces. We're trading at thirty bucks, and and again, we're going to grow not only the ounces at Mountain View and Wildcat, but that's only that small part of the portfolio that you know is is closest to development we still have the rest of the portfolio which as we will say again you, you you get for free yeah and the whole point of orla acquiring gold standard ventures was to expand into nevada because it's it is such a great uh jurisdiction and well, I, I you know anthony last last week at pdac you know jay jason and i were were we walked the floor we went to a bunch of the the networking events, you know, all everyone would come up and say is, you guys are the last one. <laughs> yep. You guys are the last guy. You guys are, you know, musical chairs and you guys still have a chair right now. Yeah. So, you know, it's going to be interesting to see how, how the next few months uh, play out. But, you know, we, we think we're very well positioned both to unlock value from the resource update and PEA, but also if someone does take a run at us in the next year or two, they're going to have to pay up. Yeah, for sure. Because I think in the next year or two, gold is going to be obviously a lot higher and you guys are going to be just that much further along. So um, I also was recently reading that, you know, the gold mining industry is still very much fragmented. And they say only the top four players account for roughly only 20% of global output. So there's, there's definitely going to be more um, consolidation in the industry for sure and the funny thing is like we, look we we don't give investment advice um that's not what we do we try to put companies like millennial precious metals on 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 people's radar so they can really take a look and, and find value but um you know we feel that you know with everything they have going on um in the way this management what this management team has done and in, in a very very short amount of time that um you know we expect the stock uh, to trade, to trade higher. Uh, and we're really, really excited about it. Um, you talked about, um, inflation, obviously will have a positive impact on gold. Um, but what kind of impact do you think it's going to have on drilling costs? Will it be substantial enough to change anything? Or do you think you'll be able to manage that? Yeah, you know, obviously inflation has an impact on everything. That's, that's the sad reality, right? Uh, luckily for us is that, you know, most of our drilling is, is almost complete. Um, and the key thing to these types of projects, open pit oxide projects, is that they are le the least susceptible to inflation. Um, and why is that? Is that it's, you know, basically digging up rock and putting on a pad and just a liner on the pad and, and just an, a small A or D plant. So the least susceptible to inflation with respects to, you know, obviously diesel prices and, and gas prices, uh, what we propose to do. And, and obviously we'll do a cost benefit analysis uh, in our in our PEA. Um, but the, what we're looking at now is that these electric haul trucks drive down loaded. So the battery gets charged and then they come up empty uh, or we use a conveyor to convey it down. So obviously we look at things to, to, to minimize the, to minimize in the environment that we're in um, from a risk perspective, but also to, to maximize, you know, the, the, the margin um, on, on these assets. Yeah. And you talked about like, uh, you know, having near surface heat bleachable ounces. Um, tell our, our viewers why that's so important in terms of, capex you know because we see a lot of these companies come out and their capex you know to get to a chunk of gold is four or five hundred million dollars and you know um it ends up being a you know a real struggle to to raise those funds and, and get that get that done um what are you looking at in terms of capex com comparable to some of those other projects out there yeah so the reason why these heat bleach projects are are are, are so sought after 
really, is because the capital intensity to build them is extremely low. And why is that? Is that, you know, something, you know, like an orogenic system up in Canada, for something to produce 125,000 ounces, that like something like this would, you know, you're looking at CapEx numbers, like, you know, three to 300, 400 million dollars, okay? Uh, whereas the CapEx here is, you know, 130, 150. And why is that? Is that it's really just, like I said, digging it up, uh, putting it through a, through a one-stage crusher or two-stage crusher, and then you just toss the rock on the pad. Uh, and then you take the loaded carbon into a stripping facility, uh, which is, you know, only 20 million bucks. So for the other types of projects that you see elsewhere, you know, big underground ones or massive open pit ones that are sulfides, you need to put them in a CIL plant. So carbon and leach or a carbon, carbon and, 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 and flow plant, you need sag mills, you need ball mills, and they're very capital intensive, whereas these aren't. The other thing that's really important is the no strip is that because you literally just dig it out and you have high grade right on surface, um, your payback is that much quicker. So your IRR obviously is a lot higher. Uh, the other great thing is, is that when you have no waste rock, when you dig up all this rock, all this rock goes onto the pad. So you don't have to manage, move waste. So all these trucks that are moving around, you don't have trucks moving rock that doesn't have gold in it. Uh, so, so your margin is a lot, a lot higher. And then the, from a permitting perspective, when you don't have to permit a waste rock facility, um, it's a lot easier to permit. It basically shaves about a year and a half to two years off your timeline. So you're, you know, basically pushing your, pushing your cash flow up two years, which is, which is significant. Absolutely. Um, obviously, geopolitical risk is very important. Obviously, you look at what's going on in like Chile and, and with the copper tax and some other issues like uh, in South America, as well as obviously the war in Russia and what's happening in Eastern Europe. Um, we had a, uh, someone ask on the last call we had, um, you know, do you see the administration in the U.S. potentially hampering drilling or permitting um, in, in any way, shape or form? Or do you think it's going to be, you know, pretty, pretty easy to get, you know, the drilling and the permitting done? Um, you know, in Nevada, um, as, as when you're doing when you have it just an EA, so an EA is just a, a, as a state permit. So Nevada controls the EA permit. Um, the, you know, the, it is a pro, the most pro mining state. You have a legal right to mine. I don't think the administration will have any impact on that. Um, when you trigger an EIS, now the federal government has a say into that. I think um, under Trump, it was amazing. NEPA had to give you approval within, within uh, uh, 12 months. Biden has removed that kind of time frame. Um, but I think, you know, globally, uh, once the world understands that you need mining, um, if you can't grow it, you have to mine it. And if we want to electrify this world, unfortunately, you're going to have to make permits and drilling a lot easier to do. Um, or else we'll just rely, rely on oil and gas from the Saudis to, to, to power our planet. So. Yeah. Hopefully, uh, hopefully the politicians will kind of clue in on, on, on what's going on. Um, but really, you know, long-winded answer is that for these types of projects uh, in Nevada, the federal government really has a minimal, minimal impact for the first phase, for the first phase. Right. Good to know. What's, uh, so uh, what's left on the pay, uh, payment to, to Waterton? When, are you, when is your obligation over to them? So at the end of 2023, okay. uh, we have another $3.2 million owed. Okay, great. And the company will obviously be, obviously be in a completely uh, different uh, position uh, yeah. then. So, That's um, a, year, a year and a half away. If we're still around, I'd be shocked. <laughs> exactly. exactly. That's someone else's problem. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, obviously, clearly gold is... is you know, no pun intended, the gold standard for, you know, fighting inflation. And we'll see that continue to go forward. It's, there's no Bitcoin as people try to uh, push, obviously, Bitcoin, you know, is, is, 
is basically uh, you know, falling off the ledge. <laughs> <laughs> Bitcoin is uh, making daily lows, and people thought that it would actually be you know a stable um, you know stable uh, currency against you know in inflation, and it's just not. And we I do think we'll see weakness in the dollar, like you suggested, uh, Jason, and I think that will obviously be good for gold. So. Um, like I said, we've been doing this for a while and we feel like we are setting up for a multi-year run in gold prices and companies like Millennial Precious Metals are either going to benefit by, you know, continuing to do what they're doing um, and coming out with a PEA and, and coming up with a re-rating or someone's going to smarten up and, uh, and buy the company out substantially higher. So um, we're going to leave it there. Um, Either Jason, um, one of you, uh, or both of you, want to just leave us with any parting words before I before I wrap this up. No, I just thanks for for your time, Anthony, and for all the listeners out there. Uh, if you have any questions, yeah, you can actually book a one on one meeting with me on on our on our website. Um, so feel free, feel free to to do that. And like we've all said, you know, this is you know one this market really goes the ones that have cash in the best jurisdiction uh, and the highest quality assets move, move first. And, you know, there's a catalyst rich story that can, that can offer, create a lot of value for, 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 for your listeners here. Absolutely. And um, if, if you, uh, it, you know, the management team uh, has made themselves accessible, which is great. And like I said earlier, they put their money where their mouth is, personal money um, in the stock, lower than where it's trading, uh, higher than where it's trading right now, excuse me. So, um, you know, they, they truly believe in the, uh, in the prospects of the company and a, as we do here. So uh, with that, I'm going to leave it there. Um, the code word for uh, feedback purposes today was Nugget, N-U-G-G-E-T. I want to thank uh, both Jason Banducci and Jason Kosick for coming on today and bringing us up to speed uh, on the company. A lot of exciting uh, developments happening. If anyone has any questions that weren't answered today, uh, feel free to reach out to me. I'll make sure it gets answered. You can also visit the company's website at millennialpreciousmetals.com, in including uh, details on the company's current projects, as well as the latest press releases. So I'll be sending out a feedback link after the close of, um, after I close this meeting down. And I look forward to your timely feedback. It's very important to us. So uh, with that, we're going to leave it there. Thank you, Jason Banducci and Jason Kosek for coming on. And uh, I'll talk to you next week. Thanks a lot. Take care. Thanks. Thank you. Right.